we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone. Um, you are attending Supporting Farm Mentors as Educators and Farmers with Jennifer Hashley. Before we jump right in, I have a few things to go through. Uh, first, we are using this slide throughout the conference to acknowledge that we are a land-based organization. We're working on the land and we are occupying land that was previously inhabited for centuries prior to European colonization. Um, and as we work towards social and agricultural equity, we want to encourage you all to learn about the land that you are inhabiting and the native and indigenous people who, who are still there. And so this is a great website to check out, nativeland.ca, and you can learn more about their ongoing structures and struggles um, through many of those links that you'll find there. As well, we have a couple of housekeeping. We are hoping that you will all stay on mute during the presentation um, to preserve sound quality. <clears throat> we will be taking questions throughout the workshop. You can put them right into the chat um, and we can bring them up during the appropriate time during question and answer periods. As well, we are recording the session for your convenience. You can see it again um, later. We obviously couldn't do this without the generous support from our sponsors. So please take a moment to support them. And we encourage you to say how much you appreciate them and their support of NOFAMANS. They are doing some really great work and innovating. So again, please uh, share your support and love with them. We of course want you to check out all of the great items on our auction, uh, our online auction. Um, as they say, you know, bid early, bid often to get those uh, really cool items that are there in the auction. We also appreciate all of our vendors for showing up. And during in between sessions, you can check out our vendor uh, vendor room and thank them for being here. So that is all that I have for um, my slides. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Jennifer Hatchley, the director of the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project, a beginning farmer training program that assists diverse individuals to begin farming in Massachusetts. Jennifer is also a vegetable and pasture-based livestock farmer and serves on the boards of the Carrot Project and the Urban Farming Institute of Boston. She's a farm business planning instructor for Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources and is an advisor to several regional food system initiatives. She served as an Agricultural Peace Corps volunteer in Honduras and holds a master's in agricultural policy from Tufts University and a BS in environmental science from Indiana University. Thank you so much for joining us, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. So I will share my screen and we'll get started. You can see that all right? All right, well, thank you for inviting me uh, to present today. And the topic that we're gonna cover today is about supporting farm mentors as both educators and farmers. So we know that farmers play a lot of different roles and when they invite learners onto their farm to train them um, in both the production and, and learning that goes and happens on, on the farm, but also so much more than that, it becomes um, a pretty important role and task. So thinking about their needs as educators and farmers and how we provide professional support to them is really the focus of today's um, discussion. So I just wanted to briefly um, cover our agenda. So I'm gonna just start with an introduction of what our agriculture Apprenticeship Learning Network is, which has evolved into, um, we're combining our apprenticeship and incubator networks um, into what we're calling the FIELD Network, which is another acronym, but so I'll talk about that and our ongoing SARE Northeast Farm Mentoring Project. So if you'd like to get involved in that or participate in upcoming trainings, I'd like to introduce that to you all. And then um, spend a little bit of time about exploring people's interest in mentorship. If you are a mentor, why do you mentor? If you're looking to develop a mentoring program or connect mentors with other agrarians, uh, we'll talk some, about some of that. We'd love to learn who's in the room and what your interests are. And then I'm gonna spend um, the rest of the time kind of going through this toolkit that we developed that we published last fall about supporting mentors to teach next agrarian farmers. So we'll go through what topics and resources are in the tools, um, talk about some examples, case studies, things like that. And we'll love to leave plenty of time for questions and answers. 
and discussion. And we'll do some of that as we go throughout as well. So first, um, I just wanna acknowledge um, Northeast SARE, who is currently supporting um, this project around farm mentor training. And we basically, the, the scope of the project is to develop regional training. So we had proposed three um, regional two-day in-person sessions throughout the Northeast region. And due to COVID, that's uh, changed a little bit. So the first two sessions um, are online. We held the first one in Maryland in January of 2021. So um, all of those recordings are online and we can put a link to the chat in the chat for that. Um, our next upcoming training will be in January. Um, the Northeast uh, MAFCA, the Maine Organic Farming and Gardening Association will be hosting those and those will also be virtual. Um, and I'll talk about those a little bit more later. But our goal for the SARE mentor trainings is both to um, promote the toolkit and to hopefully help at least, um, as the performance target states here, 20 Northeast Ag Service providers help provide more additional training and support to their mentors to adopt all these relational practices around communications, expectation setting, self-directed learning, um, to really help grow the field of um, well-prepared aspiring and beginning farmers. So again, we'll do this through the toolkit, through the trainings, through webinars, and on other online resources that we'll develop. And you can see the little graphic um, below there, kind of how all this fits together. There's both on-farm mentor and trainee relationships. If those mentors and trainees are part of a larger mentoring program, like someone like a MAFCA who you know, organizes the journey person program or their apprenticeship program, there's a lot of structure that that kind of intermediary organization um, develops to provide support to the mentor and trainee. And then our role really comes in as facilitating this broader community of practice to help kind of all of that ecosystem um, share best practices, learn from each other, not recreate wheels, um, you know, continually evolve and innovate in this space. So that's a little bit about that project. Um, and then we can also put the link in the chat to the, um, the SARE project, which I think is, is further down on that page if you find it. Um, if people wanna keep up with our reports and, and lessons learned from this project, those are all posted on the SARE website. So a little bit about the FIELD network. Again, that stands for Farm Incubation and Education Through Land-Based Skills Development. Um, we're basically combining our National Incubator Farm Training Initiative that we've had in place for almost a, uh, over a decade now and our new newer Ag Apprenticeship Learning Network. So basically we're operating these two kind of professional development networks in tandem and then decided that it makes a lot of sense moving forward to bring them together because a lot of incubator programs have apprenticeship programs that feed into their incubators and vice versa. And the real commonality that we have with both of those um, learning networks is that they're both really land-based experiential learning programs for new and beginning farmers. So we're hoping to combine all of those resources together in one much larger, uh, more impactful network. And there's some links there that we can also put in the chat if you wanna learn more about both our incubator uh, farm training initiative and our ag apprenticeship learning network. At some point later this year, we will merge those together on our website into the field network. Um, so you'll be seeing more about the field network um, nomenclature as we move forward. And um, in early 2020, we brought together all of our uh, core leadership team in both networks to really decide what did, what do we wanna be working on um, in our field network together? And really the kind of outcomes of that planning process were thinking about systems change. You know, We wanna make the space for learning and, and people getting into the business of agriculture easier. And we know that there are a lot of that barriers and challenges to finding land and capital and you know, market parity and, and economic viability and all of these challenges that make it really difficult for people to get into the business of farming. So systems change as beginning farmer educators is one that we are all interested in working on. And in order to do that well, we need to have good quality data. So we need to know that the programs that we are running work well, um, and we need to know who's doing this work, um, what are the outcomes of their training programs, and um, things like that. So we have a bunch of program level uh, data collection methods that we do. We do surveys every year of our participating programs and, and collect that and kind of try to map the outcomes that we're generating. And then we do our educational programs, again, our professional development work. We have learning events, we do a national field school, which is our national conference, um, gatherings, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, all of our webinars and online libraries and our listservs to share that information. And all of that is encompassed by um, our commitment to 
um, outreach and making sure folks know about the network and making sure that people feel included in the network. So having a real strong emphasis on racial equity and making sure that our beginning farmer training programs are encompassing folks from all different backgrounds and that people feel welcome um, and empowered to be part of the work that we're doing. So that's a little bit about the field network. Again, these are the things that, that we've been working on. We have our website resources, um, encourage folks to join the listservs if you're interested in, in asking questions of other projects and getting information and support for your program. Um, our webinar series, we have over 25 webinars that we've recorded over the last many years on different topics around apprenticeship and labor laws for farming and incubator resources, program design, all of that. Um, we have a lot of toolkits tons of curriculum, tons of program resources that apprenticeship programs and incubator programs have shared from across the country and have developed. And everyone has been so open and willing to make all of that available. So there's no need <laughs> to start from scratch and create your own. Um, just take what is there, build on it, make it your own. Um, that is what it's there for. Um, we've done a lot of case studies, doing some deep dives into the different programs, how they're designed, what works, what doesn't work. And we have a lot of evaluation frameworks. So if you are interested in learning about the outcomes of your own work, um, definitely take advantage of those resources. Um, again, we have uh, our annual survey data, things like that, and our field schools. Um, so we do put together an annual survey and every year we create what we call these infographics to really try to pull out some highlights of what's going on across the country around apprenticeship programming, um, incubator programming, and we try to keep our map up to date so that we know who's doing what where and um, we can connect people. So if, if you're looking, if you know of a participant that's gonna be moving off to Montana, wants to know who's in the farming community out there, who can help them with next steps, you know, hopefully we can make some of those matches and connections. So that's a little bit about um, this project and why we're doing this work and why we're excited to take the next steps and um, support mentors with skill development. Um, again, really, I think one of the, the key things for us has been that a lot of folks who learn to farm and we're new entry as a beginning farmer training program, we run an incubator farm, we run a food hub, we want to work with people who want to start their, their agricultural businesses. But a lot of people learn to farm by working on someone else's farm. And so the goal of this project and all of this work really is to make those learning opportunities as robust and meaningful as possible so that people feel like they have the tools and skills to succeed and feel like they have the support um, that they need both personally and professionally as they move forward with their journey. So um, I'd love to learn about a little bit more about who's here. I know we seem to be a, a little bit of a small group at this point, but um, I thought I would just ask some general questions. And if you can raise your hand or if you wanna use the little um, uh, emojis down below, you could just uh, put your thumb up if, if this uh, fits who you are. So if you wanna raise your hand, if you are a farmer, all right, great. Um, are you a service provider who works with farmers? Okay, great. And are you, would you call yourself a mentor to other, other trainees or other farmers or anyone else in your life, I guess? Great, cool. And would you, if you're not already a mentor, would you like to be a mentor? Or would you like to be a better mentor? <laughs> Awesome. And have you ever had a good mentor? Have you ever had someone in your life who's been a good mentor to you? All right, great. Well, thank you for that. Um, and so I just wondered if we could also share a little bit, I'm gonna ask you a different question. Um, when you think about a role model in your life also, just to do our, our little introductions, if you wanna share your name, um, maybe where you're from, and then think a little bit for a minute and I'll give you a minute and just share with us, you know, who is somebody that you see as a role model or who's someone that you'd like to be in your professional career and tell us a, a minute or two about why, who they are and, and why you chose them. Would anyone like to go first? Yeah, I don't mind going. Um, a mentor who really stands out to me is my grandmother. Um, 
she's 95 now and is just like the queen of efficiency and conservation and like she doesn't even know it (laughs) and um growing up she really really loves um what stood out to me was um like her bountiful raspberries and blackberries she's really really good at growing them and then of course her flowers and she take pictures of her flowers and was just really really proud of the things that she was doing and making pies and jams and all sorts of stuff and that really stuck with me because in my childhood there wasn't much of that and so she was just like so in it not because of sustainability not because of just out of like pure joy and appreciation great Awesome. And do you want to tell us your name and where you're from? Yeah, sorry. Um, my name is Hannah. I actually work with NOFA Mass. And um, right now I'm living in Westfield um, on Pakam Tuck land. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. It sounds like your grandmother is an amazing woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Great. Would anyone like to go next? I can go next. I'm uh, Jess Camp, a beginning farmer coordinator with, um, sorry, beginning farmer specialist uh, with the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. So there I coordinate the mega program um, as well as the Exploring the Small Farm Dream course that Jennifer teaches. Um, And we are looking at adding a mentorship component to the mega program for the upcoming uh, year. Um, and as far as a role model, I'm kind of uh, at a transition. My my so I also work um, at doing bookkeeping and financials for the farm I used to work for. So I'm at sort of a a professional transition where I've stopped farming full time um, and am into support services. Uh, so I don't quite yet uh, have a role model in that space. Um, But speaking from farming, one of my, the the person I apprenticed for is probably um, a great role model, Uh, a fantastic boss, uh, you know, kind of organized, but also great with feedback, um, very aware, self-aware, as well as aware of the um, team. and just a really positive, fantastic person. Awesome. That sounds great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we all want that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyone else want to share? Great, Juan. Hi, everyone. My name is Juan. I am from Cali, Colombia. Um, I studied a master's in environmental science and rural development. And during this time, my mentor, uh, his name is Eduardo Bello. I think one of the best qualities, uh, he was a professor, um, mostly analyzing rural change in Southern Mexico. Um, Some of the best qualities of a mentor, in my opinion, is someone who lets you make decisions and also makes makes you uh, commit mistakes um, and guides you through questions instead of through orders and, and, and forceful ways. And I think mentors could definitely become amazing um, teachers, uh, not only just in the field or the topic you are working in, but also life mentors. Um, if they empower you with the ability to make mistakes and decisions uh, by yourself, you know? Right now, recently moved here, and um, in some way I'm part of, I, I'm part of the, the subjects that you are talking about in this presentation. I, I'm, I'm farming in, in central Massachusetts. And, and during, I, I got tired of tired of um, just speaking about farming and said, well, if I'm gonna speak about farming all the time, maybe I just, I should learn more of this empirical knowledge and, t- and, and feel it with my own body. Uh, and then I will have a really, uh, a good back, a, a good foundation to speak about farming and what it takes and what it is. So I am uh, now being mentored by a farmer in central Massachusetts um, who has uh, who is teaching me a bit, a bit of a bit about this mostly way of life, I would I would call it. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, what I would say a good mentor is someone who teaches by asking questions and letting you make decisions and mistakes. 
Awesome. I could not have said that better myself. So thank you for saying all of that. That's awesome. Yeah. Great. Anyone else, Lisa or Doug? All right. Well, thank you all for introducing yourselves and um, appreciate your sharing your reflections. And I'm glad so many of you have had great role models and or mentors. And one of the points that I, I wanted to make, and I think um, Juan just highlighted that really well, is usually a role model is not a mentor, right? Um, when we think about that, like somebody that we look up to as a role model can be, you know, somebody that we look up to or imitate, but mentors really are a lot more than that. And I think um, Juan just defined that really, really well. And a lot of times, I think um, these definitions can be kind of confusing, you know, are you a coach, an advisor, a role model, a trainer, a, a mentor. And so when we think about the word mentor, we really worked hard to try to define what that means. Cause sometimes it does mean different things to different people or sometimes the mentor is playing all of these different roles at the same time. And it's hard to, to suss that out. So we kind of came up with a, a few different definitions and tried to clarify that um, in the toolkit that I'll be talking about later. We have you know almost four pages of definitions trying to clarify what all these different things mean. So, but, you know, breaking it down again, you know, mentors are really these trusted in individuals. They also, they have a lot of experience, but who is really helping to center your learning um, and make sure that you are um, developing as a person, as a whole person, really, not just necessarily in the subject expertise, but having a relationship with you where they understand all aspects of your goals, um, your life goals, you know, your challenges, where you, you struggle, and really looking to remove those barriers to help you succeed. So it's much more of a holistic relationship than um, a role model that you just look up to or a coach who might just be helping you refine certain skills that you have in the moment, um, but somebody that's really looking out for your whole self. So that's kind of how we're thinking about a mentor in this context and putting that in the context of an agricultural mentor or a farm-based mentor where there's a lot going on <laughs> means that taking on that, that really critical role is often more than just giving somebody a work experience on a farm. And so that's kind of our point with this, um, helping mentors really understand the depth and um, you know, beauty in that role is, is a lot. <laughs> so how do we support them to, to make sure that they're really paying attention to that really broad definition of what a mentor is and what people are looking for um, in a mentor? So I wanted to highlight um, the wonderful work that Baranda Montgomery, um, who is an, as an academic and professor, um, I had the pleasure of attending a training that she offered to um, a group of faculty and staff at Tufts around establishing um, mentoring ecosystems within the graduate school, because a lot of times when we think about institutions of higher learning or other academic situations, um, there's a lot of faculty student mentoring going on. And even though this was in a very different context, than what we might think about in terms of farm, farm mentorship. I really, really um, love the principles that she was um, talking about, about how do you create a mentoring ecosystem? And so given that this is a farming audience too, I was just really neat that she um, has written this book called Lessons from Plants and really talks about how um, mentorship and um, really looking at the whole individual is not really about guiding someone around through all these you know, barriers and helping them overcome things and, and getting to where they wanna go, but it's you know, really about clearing that pipeline. And so it's really thinking about what are all the ways that we look at um, the mentoring ecosystem. And, and we as a mentor are part of a bigger system of learning and access and, um, you know, and growing as individuals. And one of the um, great examples that she provided was like when, when we think about a plant, you know, if our plant isn't really doing well, do we blame it on the plant? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, that plant's just not sucking up nutrients. It's just not doing this. It's not doing that. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. Like, you know, you can make that analogy, right? Like if your, your trainee is just like, you know, setting up the fence wrong or whatever, we don't go, what's wrong with that person? You know, or, or sometimes we do, right? We're like, why can't they figure this out? I've told them 12 times. But when we look at a plant, if they're not doing well, if it's underwatered or whatever, we, we don't blame the plant. We look at ourselves as the stewards of that person, of that plant and try to figure out, well, what does it need? What is it, you know, is it not getting enough nitrogen? Is it not getting enough water? Is it not getting enough sunlight? 
we're looking at all the, the framework around, around that plant and trying to figure out what it is that they need to thrive. And so I would encourage you to um, look at some of the resources that, that Baranda, um, Dr. Montgomery has created. And um, Juan will put some of those in the chat. There's some articles that I'd love to share. Um, and if you ever get a chance to hear her speak, um, I highly encourage you to take advantage of that or look at the book. So a lot of great resources there. So thinking about why we mentor and what does it mean to mentor, um, I'd love everybody to just, we did talk about this a little bit earlier about think about a mentoring relationship that you're involved in um, and some of the goals or expectations that you have for that relationship. What does that look like to you? Um, you know, one of the ways that, that we think about mentor skills and attributes, um, you know, and we heard some of this, and I'll just talk through a few examples of it, but, you know, most trainees um, say that a good mentor is somebody that asks good questions of them, right? Wants to like draw out what they already know and build on that. Um, they challenge them when they need a kick in the pants, you know, they support them when they make mistakes, as, as Juan mentioned. They have patience, you know, they give advice that's both professional and personal. Um, they're open and trustworthy. Um, they share their own questions, mistakes, and learnings. You know, hopefully, you know, if you've signed up to be a mentor, you realize you're also always learning and on that lifelong journey to continue to grow and, and improve yourself. And they coach you on the skills that you want to learn and they care about you as a person, not just a worker. And they're really knowledgeable about their business and everything that goes into it. So are there other qualities or characteristics that you all think um, should be added to that list or that you've gotten out of your own mentorship experiences? You can either share that in the chat or if anyone wants to just unmute themselves and share, that would be great. I'm sorry, I can't see the chat. So if you are using that. Um, Lisa mentioned in the chat, they should make you feel safe and comfortable being yourself. Great, yeah, I love that. Thank you. Cool, so another way to think about um, this, and, and this is from page 42 of the toolkit, just so um, if you wanna come back to this list that I'm rattling off here, it, it is written down <laughs> somewhere too. You can refer back to it, but you know, we kind of came up with the one of the main skills that people say they want in a mentor isn't knowledge or expertise, but it's really about listening. Um, so that's one of the key things that I think people really feel like they want to feel heard. And I think we all know what that feels like to want to be listened to and have somebody really hear you and understand you and, and deeply listening to you is, is almost a gift. It's not something that we get very often. And so when we do, I think we really appreciate it. And so, you know, another way to think of, of a good mentor is someone that really has the ability to listen and hear what is said, um, question and challenge their own thinking and the thinking of others, um, summarize and reflect back what they're hearing or what they're seeing. Um, and that's also a really important skill to be able to do that and to give and receive constructive feedback. Um, and that can be really important, um, but also really difficult so that if you're, if you're not good at um, managing conflict or figuring out how to give critical feedback, those are important skills to be thinking about. Um, good mentors also point out connections and contradictions. They display empathy and understanding, um, encourage problem solving and seeking of solutions and recognizing and acknowledging emotions. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're in a mentoring relationship, especially on a farm setting, you're working together all day, every day, you might be living in the same place, you know, you're constantly interacting. So being able to recognize and acknowledge that to preserve the relationship is important. Um, and good mentors are trusted by others and trust others and place their trust in others. And they're open and honest um, with themselves and others. So a lot of great, great qualities and a lot of responsibility, I think, to think about what it means to be a mentor. So just wanted to share this also is from um, Dr. Montgomery's work, but um, this is kind of a nice graphic of a roadmap of the mentoring relationship. So, and this can be looked at from both sides, both the mentor and the trainee. So thinking about, you know, the mentor, like what do I need? When do I need it? Um, what are the skills or resources that, 
that I might be looking for and where can I find it? Um, and same thing for the mentor side, like what do I need to be, to show up as a good mentor, you know, and where, and what areas do I need support as a mentor and where am I going to get that professional support? You know, sometimes it feels pretty lonely being the mentor and the farmer and like running around playing all these roles, wearing all these hats, like where do the mentors get that support as well um, and learn how to better improve their practice as a mentor. So that's kind of like, how do both people come to the space um, and this partnership? And then establishing the terms of engagement um, with their relationship. So what is the relationship? Um, what is its purpose? How long will it last? You know, what is the framework that they're gonna use? Um, I'll talk in a minute about goal setting and things like that. And, and are, there are plenty of tools that we reference in the toolkit that I'll mention um, about developing those that shared learning goals or a learning plan or an individual development plan or creating smart goals, you know, figuring out what is um, the framework of what that's going to look like, how often are people going to meet, um, and again, it's one thing to be working alongside someone every day in the field, it's another to take that pause and stop and come back to the, you know, actually the relationship piece and say, let's check in, you know, like, let's actually have a weekly meeting about my learning goals and make sure that I'm getting the information and the education that I need, or committing to doing that once a month or four times during the year, whatever it is, but that there's actually a structured time and place for working on that mentoring relationship. Um, and then what are the goals of those meetings and interaction? Is it to you know, provide feedback, constructive criticism, set new goals, um, provide resources for self-directed learning? Um, what are the expectations of, of those interactions? And then there's the maintenance of it. You know, again, pointing back to the frameworks or agreements or whatever else that it is that you are, um, have agreed to do, making sure that you're actually following through with it. You know, it can get so busy <laughs> during the season that this can sometimes be the last thing people want to do and then they forget or they don't commit to it. And so holding themselves accountable for maintaining that relationship and nurturing those bilateral interactions and making sure that, that there's feedback going back and forth, that the mentor is getting what they need from the trainee and making sure that that they're providing what they need and, and vice versa, making sure the trainee is getting what they need from the mentor. And then again, um, moving ahead, periodic goals, renegotiation if needed, as the mentorship kind of run its course, um, what are the next steps? And sometimes, you know, on farms, when people at the end of the season, is that it? Or a lot of mentors that I know in our network, you know, they keep in, keep in touch with their trainees for the rest of their lives. You know, it becomes such a personal relationship that it doesn't really have an end point. So again, this can be something that is a lifelong um, commitment and relationship to another individual um, based on the relationship that you forge in this process. And feel free to interrupt if there are any questions. We're a small group. So if there's anything that people want to bring up as we go along, um, please let me know. Um, so about the goal setting piece there, as I mentioned, a lot of resources in the toolkit. Um, one of the things that this example, the individual development plan, you know, is used a lot in academia, but really oftentimes it starts with a self-assessment of like, what are all the skills and, um, capacity and competencies and other things that someone is starting with. Um, a new entry has another great resource that we developed um, a long time ago called, um, you know, the skills and competencies needed for, you know, new and beginning farmers. And so we tried to compile all of the DACOM curriculum profiles that were out there into one gigantic, you know, 100 plus page um, checklist. So I'm happy to share that. I didn't include that in the links yet, but I'll um, be able to send that out if anyone's interested. But that's, you know, there are tons of skills and checklists and things out there. So thinking about what are your trainees coming with already, and that might help them identify which areas you really want to focus on um, to develop their learning plan. And then, yeah, thinking about where do they want to head next? Do they want to just continue on to gain more farming skills? Do they want to work on different types of enterprises from livestock to fruit to vegetables to value added? what is it that their career goals are? Are they really wanting to start their own farm? Are you the last you know, mentor farmer that they're gonna have before they go off and, and launch their own business? You know, all, Figuring out where they're at in that trajectory is really important. And then setting those goals for what they're gonna learn with their time with you and then making a plan um, to implement that. Um, and then again, that whole process that we just talked about with um, making sure that you're constantly revisiting those plans and checking in and have an accountability mechanism to make sure that this isn't just something you create at the beginning of the season and then hope that it magically is getting addressed. <laughs> so 
um, goal setting is important. So I thought maybe um, you know we could take a few moments um, thinking about all of the skills and attributes of a men mentor that we just talked about. And if you're thinking about being a mentor, like or taking on this role, or looking for others to take on this role, um, you know who would you be as a mentor? What aspects of yourself would you bring to a mentoring relationship? You know what would be some of your strengths and weaknesses or biases, um, and what skills would you need to be a good member, mentor? Are there anything on the list of desired mentor skills that seem like, oh geez, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know if I could do that. Or I don't know if I'm ready to take on that responsibility. Like what would be the other things that you would feel like you would need to bring to that relationship? Any thoughts? Sure, Juan. I think the um, what you were saying about the, being transparent and also uh, clear about, um, so I was thinking about mentors at times, they would feel overwhelming because of, of life and events that happens in their, in their process. No? And um, bad communication in a week could lead to breaking that relationship. No? So, I think when mentors are capable enough to uh, transmit and be transparent with their feelings and emotions and empathize uh, and, and, and let people understand that there's moments where they cannot be mentors anymore and the student has to understand that th those empathetic relationships between students and mentors, I think are key. Um, not everyone is cut to be a mentor um, due to that. I think management of emotions and life at the same time while taking the responsibility of mentoring somebody else, no? So I think that's a huge quality that um, individuals in this case would have to apply to become excellent mentors. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Um, one of the, the pages in the, in the toolkit um, is all about emotional intelligence and there's a lot of resources linked to that. And that's just a huge, field of, of study and, and people are talking more and more about it, about, you know, having good emotional intelligence is such an important characteristic in a leader and in life and things like that. And yeah, being able to, um, to develop that, I guess, is, is a lifelong skill, but being able to know when to step back and how to, how to function in those roles is really important. Great, thank you for sharing. Anyone else? All right, well, good things to be thinking about. I'll just say too, um, you know, one of the other great resources in here, if you're thinking about starting a mentorship program, as, as just mentioned, um, there's a, some great questions that you could ask, you know, both the Kibera Coalition and Rogue Farm Corps have a lot of questions around, are you a good fit? You know, are you a good fit to be a mentor? Um, that's really helpful to have people to think through, you know, and they say, you know, start with the why. Why do you want to start an apprenticeship or a mentorship program of some kind um, on your farm or ranch? What's personally appealing about being a mentor to you? What are the long-term goals for your, for your program? And, and how does this fit into that? And how might an apprenticeship or a mentoring relationship or something else fit into those goals? And then thinking about their skills and experience that they bring um, to it. You know, what are people most proud of um, or excited about around their farm or ranch that they wanna share with someone else? And what do they wanna impart, you know, their values? Um, and again, thinking about, you know, that person should think about who the mentors were in their life um, and how they were mentors to them and what personal qualities they already have that would serve them as a mentor and what aspects of their personalities um, could be challenged by the role of the mentor. You know, what are those emotions that need to be regulated? You know, do you get frustrated easily? You know, are you quick to lash out? You know, those are the kind of things that that might be really challenging to you in being a mentor if um, if those things are hard for you. Um, and you know, also what, how much time and energy and patience do you have to share with with an apprentice or a mentor, a trainee? You know, what ways are you? Our mentors being prepared to be a trainer, employer, a counselor, a teacher, a mediator, a life coach, you know, all these things, again, like all those roles 
and, and what might be hard about that? Um, and do people really have the time to check in with their trainee to assess their learning? I mean, that takes a lot of time and thought. You know, how flexible are you? How easily will you adapt your daily routines and work schedules and operations to include somebody that you're committing to mentor? Um, and how comfortable will you be to accept critique and criticism and suggestions from your trainee? You know, it's a two-way street as we've talked about it. It's an interpersonal dynamic relationship you're not just giving them feedback on how well they're doing and how well they're learning. It should be a two-way process. So if you don't handle <laughs> critique well, you know, that could be a challenge for you as well. And then you know, there's nuts and bolts considerations as well that are more practical in nature. You know, do you have adequate housing on your property? Is it separate from your own? Does it have a private space um, for folks to you know, have their own time? You know, does it have adequate heating and cooling. You know, I always like to joke like, oh, the apprentices are living out in the back of the barn or on a tent, you know, on the farm somewhere. Um, you know, easy access to a bathroom and running water and cooking and bathing facilities. You know, those things are, we think they're silly, but, you know, taking for granted if someone's working hard and also trying to learn just being a, in a comfortable place and position. You know, has, has this operation supported employees in the past? You know, and and again, thinking about, well, we won't get into labor laws and employment law around apprenticeships and internships and employees, but there are you know, serious you know, distinctions. So do our folks, do they have payroll, workers comp, et cetera? Sometimes a lot of new and beginning farmers who learn by, by being part of an apprenticeship network or working on someone else's farms in those situations are perpetuating those you know, situations as well. And so they come to their own new farm and just try to hire, you know, I'll pay you a few hundred bucks a month and you live in the barn and eat the food and that's your situation. And we're trying to professionalize, you know, how people learn and really valuing agriculture as a skilled trade. So thinking about how we, you know, professionalize, um, you know, it is, you can be, get paid on the job training and, you know, have adequate housing and really take seriously the role of, of educator and mentor. So, you know, thinking about offering fair compensation in exchange for labor and those things um, and, and do value that extra education and, and maybe build that in, making sure it has, you know, regular um, other workshops and supplemental things that folks can be part of as they're learning from you. So again, you know, a lot of times people in, engage their mentors or trainee or their trainees in craft meetings, the Collaborative Regional Alliance for Farmer Training, or give them a conference registration for NOFA whatever the case may be. Um, so making sure that they're also exposed to other learning opportunities as well as what you know, as the mentor can teach them. And then being prepared to have some structure around it. Um, so again, regular you know, operations calendar, work schedule, time off, um, scheduled planning meetings, scheduled check-in meetings around learning goals. So thinking about all of those things are really critical to deciding if you're ready to be a mentor. So, um, I don't think we'll do the breakout group since we're a small, small enough group here, but just again, thinking about, would love for, for folks to take away from this, you know, what strengths that you might have that would contribute toward establishing and maintaining a framework um, of a positive mentoring ecosystem, or if you're going to create a mentorship program, like how can you facilitate that in your work? So um, just some other considerations, again, also just thinking about what strengths you might have, what are some gaps that you might have or that you could provide. And this is where um, I wanted to, to move into the overview of the toolkit that we've developed because we hope that um, it, it can serve as a comprehensive guide to both support the strengths that people already have as mentors um, and add new knowledge, but also fill in some of those gaps in learning that people may need as they're entering into this incredible role as a mentor. So um, the toolkit overview, it's six chapters, as I mentioned, it's available free online. I encourage you to, to read through it. It's a lot, but there's, a, and we really tried, there's a lot of great resources out there. The New England Small Farm Institute has an on-farm mentoring guide that we also really encourage you to look at. Um, we reference that throughout this guide as well as appropriate, but there are so many other great resources that we didn't want to repeat what's out there, but really compile it all into one framework with lots and lots of links to resources. So you'll see that throughout the toolkit. And I'm going to go through each of the chapters and just highlight, talk about some of the highlights that's in here um, so you know what to look for as, as you go forward um, and use this resource. So um, we do start with an overview and introduction and definitions. As I said, there's lots of definitions. Um, 
throughout. But the first chapter, one of the things that we wanted to talk about is really around building that mentor network. I hope we've already, I've already demonstrated there's a lot to being a network, a mentor. And mentors, you know, like anyone, don't want to feel like they're on an island by themselves doing this incredible task of both farming and teaching someone else and, and you know, being this coach and guide because there's a lot to it. So really having um, a place where mentors can go and learn from each other and share strategies and best practices and challenges and things like that is really important. And if you as a if you are a service provider and thinking of starting a new mentorship program where you might be matching learners and mentors and other things, you know, also looking at it from a programmatic perspective, why are you building this men mentor network? You know, who do you want to serve? What's the desired outcome for people that are going to be part of this process and for the program? So there's both participant level goals and program level goals. And then hopefully we're doing this to <laughs> serve larger societal and planetary goals. And you know what really is in it for the people that are going to be participating. A lot of times people really you know, lament that you know, mentors aren't really paid the value of the expertise and the time that they're offering. So there's some other intrinsic value there. And so being able to articulate that in your program and attract people to that, I think will go a long way to making sure that that people in it are in it for the right reasons. And so if you focus on the why, then like, who do you need? How do you identify mentors? How do you outreach and recruit them? You know, in the toolkit, there's a lot of criteria that other programs have already used for spelling out, you know, some base, baseline information, you know, how long have they been farming? Where are they? What's, what's their philosophy? You know, how many contact hours? Are they putting people on payroll and paying them a fair wage? You know, all of those kinds of considerations, practical considerations. Um, and then vetting them, you know, are you going to, you know, some programs do a lot of heavy vetting and make sure that the mentors in their programs are really meeting all the criteria they've out outlined for their programs and some take more of a hands off approach and they're just doing a coordination service. You know, obviously our, our values might be more leaning toward the vet heavy, more heavy vetting side so that you make sure that people that are representing your program are you know, meeting the, the goals that you've set for it, but some people have applications for mentors, some people do site visits, some people request references of, fire, of you know, prior trainees. Um, and then, so thinking about how you wanna vet the mentors for your program um, and then onboarding strategies, you know, how are you going to get them all on the same page to meet the program criteria that you have? Um, the Kibera Coalition does a series of monthly mentor training calls they do different professional development topics. Um, they might do webinars or meetings or bring in a special speaker. Um, and then obviously sharing um, some tools and resources with their mentors to make sure that they have the support they need. Um, they've also created some buddy systems, you know, maybe pairing a, a mentor with another mentor to learn from each other to bounce ideas and questions, or if they're struggling with, you know, I'm really having a hard time communicating with my trainee. Like, how do I do this? Maybe they have someone else they can can talk to or, or call. So thinking about a network for your mentors and how you get them. So that's the point of that chapter. Um, and then really the next chapter are all the different training topics. We kind of say this is the heart of the toolkit. There's so much <laughs> that, um, that we think we hear or we've heard over the last you know, six years or so from mentors saying that they struggle with or you know, in surveys that we've done things they want to learn more about. And a lot of times, you know, it's not, they don't need to know how to teach the production side. They're already experts in that. It really comes down to a lot of the soft skills um, of, you know, interpersonal communication, feedback, you know, all of those things. And so that is really the focus of chapter two. And I just want to point out in this photo, I didn't get a chance to say who my role model was <laughs> or or one of the best mentors. Um, I haven't worked directly um, as a mentee with Julie Sullivan. She's pictured in the center right between the two dogs back there, but she has been, um, I can imagine she's probably one of the best mentor farmers <laughs> out there. She's uh, the founding mentor of the Kibera Coalition. She's been part of this project that we've been working on for the last five or six years. And she's just one of the most thoughtful, dedicated um, educators, experiential ed educators that I've ever met. So if you ever get a chance to, to be part of a workshop by Julie Sullivan, um, I would really encourage it. And she's the author of, of this chapter and the first chapter and, and has been a speaker on many of our webinars. But she used to, to be on the, the bus, um, that experiential learning bus that, that went around the United States and ended up 
falling in love with a rancher in Colorado and settling down there, but um, really does an amazing job with their apprenticeship program and supporting, uh, supporting mentorship training. So good person to know. Um, so chapter two really talks about some of the things I've already gone over, mentoring skills and attributes. And then, like I said, gets into a lot of the, the soft skills around communication, styles. Um, there's a link that I think I put in the, the thing if you wanted to look at your own communication style survey from Henry Ford. Um, there's a bunch of resources in there to in the toolkit talking about communication and conflict management and how do you mitigate you know, that or thinking about you know, de-escalating conflict when it happens. Um, really talk about learning styles, emotional intelligence, um, personality types, how to provide good feedback, um, different examples of that. There's a really great um, learning spiral of like, so what, now what, then what, um, a lot of those great frameworks in the, in the thing about learning styles to figure out and with examples from you know, farm and ranch um, settings to think about how you could incorporate that into your, your teaching and learning. Um, how to provide good feedback. We have a whole section on balancing work and education. You know, how do you make every um, you know, work opportunity a learning opportunity? And not everyone, but as many as you can by asking targeted questions and, and engaging you know, and really setting expectation. And then we also added a whole section on intergenerational elements, because I think as we recognize as farmers are getting older and, you know, new and young people are, are coming into the, um, excited about farming and regenerative agriculture and other aspects of the social and community dynamic of agriculture and farming. Um, oftentimes there can be you know, feel like people are speaking a different language because, because the older generation comes from a different time and place and culture sometimes and it seems like the younger generation does. And so how do you deal with those intergenerational dynamics as well? So there's a lot of rich resources and references in the toolkit covering those topics. A few of the key items, um, as I mentioned, I think a lot of things in here that, that I've really learned a lot from myself, um, just understanding adult learning styles and how it's different than we might expect and really how to meet people where they're at. And, um, and again, that what, so what, now what cycle is really useful. And then there's a lot of resources around relationship building because that's really the heart of the mentoring relationship as we've talked about. So, you know, how to conduct um, check-ins and feedback and skills. Um, one of my favorite podcasts is called Radical Candor. Um, you know, I'm the director of my organization. Oftentimes, you know, it's like sometimes really tough to, there's so many things you want to say to people and it's hard to keep your staff motivated. The you know, same thing with farming and mentoring. Um, so this um, Radical Candor podcast and book um, by a woman named Kim Scott, um, she just has a great approach to providing people with really, you know, feed, radical feedback coming from a place of, of love and caring of the individual. And so there's some good resources there. Four quick questions to ask um, to make sure that people are understanding and, and really getting the, the lessons that you're trying to impart. Um, Brene Brown's, you know, Dare to Lead. She's got a lot of great re um, resources and things. Just want to point out, look at those. And then um, the Thomas Kilman complex styles, you know, really trying to understand, well, what's your own comfort with conflict? And like, what is the person you're working with's comfort from conflict? And those things might be very different. So just understanding that among each other um, can really help, you know, build and enhance those relationships. So that's, that is the big chunk of the toolkit is a lot of those kind of interpersonal things that I think are really the heart of what a lot of mentors need. So I encourage you to look, look through that. Chapter three um, really gets into um, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you know, this is really, we did not wanna pretend that we <laughs> were experts or could cover all the great work that's been done out there, but really wanted to um, address the fact that you know, more and more, 98% you know, or whatever it is, you know, most of farmers are, are white and we all, well, if we're educated, we, we know a lot of the reasons why that is and all the issues of systemic racism and land theft and genocide and issues of slavery and land loss and you know, historic discrimination by USDA and just you know, how that, the BIPOC representation in agriculture has deeply declined. And so we, we, we wanted to make sure that people who, um, farmers who may become mentors who may not be as aware or educated of a lot of those resources or someone who's gonna become a mentor 
understands that people coming to them may be coming from multiple identities. And then how do we encourage people getting into agriculture um, from these different identities to feel welcome and included and um, you know, represented in, in the work that they need? And how do they feel safe in these communities that where they may be the only person of that particular identity um, in that community? We think a lot about in, in other parts of the country where it's very rural and very white, you know, people, you know, women getting into agriculture, maybe, you know, there's lots of different identities and genders um, or a person of color in those situations or a transgender person or any of those different identities maybe, um, you know, feel very alone or like the only one there. So we talk a lot about definitions. Um, if someone hasn't really started their own learning and unlearning process around diversity, equity and inclusion and, and anti-racism work, you know, where would someone get started? And then this is where you know, maybe if you're running a program, working with a consultant or someone who is skilled in doing equity-based training, anti-racism training makes a lot of sense to bring your mentors together and have a shared training and you know, or introduce some of these histories that people may not be aware of um, and really helping them define what their own values are around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so, Again, we really do reference a lot of resources. There's so much reading that can happen out there. There are a lot of different challenges, things like that, that um, people can expose themselves to. So the, the toolkit covers a little bit of information about you know, some of the policies and underrepresentation and you know, how do we, thinking about how do we build and ensure inclusive and equitable learning environments um, in agriculture and provides these definitions so that people can use a shared language. And it, it is challenging sometimes because these definitions seem to be constantly evolving as different communities, you know, state claim and, and wanna find themselves um, in the space um, and define for themselves how, how they wanna be called or how they respond or relate to different words that we use. And we also highlight throughout, you know, the National Young Farmer Coalition has developed a racial equity toolkit which is excellent. Um, we didn't want to recreate elements of that. So draw, um, drew heavily from that and referenced that a lot throughout this chapter. Um, and then there's a really you know, great glossary of um, you know, equity, diversity, and inclusion terms that Pacific University used that we also included in here for folks to educate themselves around and just all kinds of other great resources. So encourage folks, um, if they have not done a lot of this work, encourage your mentors to do it. Um, there's a lot of self-assessment resources. There are racial ha equity habit building challenges, um, resource books, the toolkit, and all kinds of other links for folks to get more information about how you build an inclusive envir learning environment on your farm or in your program. Um, so, and yeah, and our, our final point in that chapter was just, well, get started, you know, create the structure, you know, make the case, get the information, create a map, you know, and, and, and do it and evaluate how you're doing. And working with a consultant can certainly help um, if you don't feel comfortable doing that on your own or leading that effort, um, you know, creating caucus or affinity groups and having trainings and referrals and things like that to support mentors and others um, in that way. So in some organizations, we gave some examples throughout this chapter um, are creating equity statements for their farm or, you know, making clear what their values are for their farms. Um, and as we started out this session, uh, really learning and, and acknowledging and lifting up the history of the land that they're on and connected to. And so, as I said, there's lots of definitions and links to resources. And um, we also included a lot of resources for other aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just racial um, justice resources, but you know, ableism, ageism, classism, sexism, intersectionality and the resources around that and um, heterosexism and other isms that can get in the way of you know, people showing up for them full selves and how that may or may not affect their ability to um, you know, learn and grow or you know, feel like they're really getting what they need out of the experience um, on the farm that they're working on. So just really understanding that people come from all different backgrounds and identities and intersectionalities of identities and how that can show up in their, their ability. You know, their learning and their relationship with you as a mentor. So chapter four um, is really about, um, again, continuing education in this peer-to-peer -peer network for mentors. We talk about how do you start a, men a net mentor network support um, group? How do you set expectations for participation? Um, how do you 
get people together. Um, there's a, some great resources around, you know, if you've never read Priya Parker's book, The Art of Gathering, um, it really defining the purpose of the group. Um, that's a great resource to, to look through. And then Kivira has a great mentor survey um, model that we include as well that really talks, that helps you pull out from the mentors themselves, what are the things that they wanna learn from, from their peers. Um, and we talk about, you know, organizing social events, formal trainings or workshops, webinars, monthly calls, um, email chains, Google groups, or any other kind of social medium to keep the mentors connected um, to, to one another. And then sustaining that over time, you know, how do you continue to make value in, um, in these networks? So connecting with them often, um, getting out onto the farms and meeting the mentors and making sure it's meeting the mentors needs and building the relationships. So that's kind of chapter four. Um, and then chapter five is um, a real, a different kind of uh, consideration. So a lot of times we think about mentors on farms as just a seasonal thing, or they're kind of participating for a short period of time. And we wanted to also represent the fact that they're are sometimes expectations of mentors that they're really identifying someone to take over their business. <laughs> and that's a very different kind of mentoring, can potentially be a very different kind of mentoring relationship than someone who may come in seasonally or stay for one or two seasons and then go work on another farm or go start their own farm. When you're mentoring a potential successor, um, there are a lot of different um, considerations. And that's really what chapter five covers. And, and these slides, Kathy Roof um, did, I'll go through them very quickly because um, we're happy to share the slides. But you know, it's a real challenge for older farmers who don't have an identified successor or, or an exit um, plan. And so the entry and exit are the same size of the coin. And this is really how, you know, when you when you think about all the farms that are going to change hands in the next 20 years, you know, a lot of times. Folks want to mentor someone because they're hoping they'll take over the farm. And so, you know, thinking about what that, what is that farm succession um, look like? It, it can be this transfer of, of the land, the income, the assets, or something. Normally that might happen from one generation in the same family to the next, but, you know, potentially not. And so it, it involves all of these, you know, really complex, you know, business and estate transactions and legal and financial and managerial aspects, and then the communication of that. And there's the planning of it, and then there's the executing of it. So farm succession is a pretty complicated endeavor. And when people think about recruiting a successor, most people hope that someone next in line in the family is going to do that. Um, but it's not always how it works. There's a lot of due diligence and buy-in and all of these things listed here, formality, terms, timing. It can feel overwhelming um, to think about how you're going to pass on what might be a very long multi-generational operation to the next generation. So this is where the, the rubber meets the road. If someone doesn't have someone in the family, or even if they do, um, if they're trying to mentor someone that's going to stay on the farm, you know, is what is what is the order of operations? Is the mentor coming, you know, mentoring someone and the mentor stays on the farm and the trainee leaves as, an, as the typical situation, like a seasonal um, operation? Or if you're mentoring a successor, does the mentor leave the operation and the trainee stays? And how long of a time frame does that happen? Is it immediate? Is it gradual? Is it a decade? You know, what does that, that time frame look like? And that's all going to dictate what that relationship is over, over time. So thinking about a trainee as a potential successor, you know, where is the family farm in the succession planning process? You know, has everybody in the in the business or has a vested interest in the business been you know involved in thinking about that and you know all of these kind of big questions um is it a pretty overt or you know <laughs> not very obvious search process you know what qualities and qualifications what's the offer i mean is this something that that the person the the, the potential mentor is even making um making obvious, you know, are they saying I'm looking for a potential successor or I want to mentor you as my successor? What does that look like? You know, how do you even, you know, articulate that? So making sure that you're sharing those expectations of mentor and trainee, you know, and the time frame and roles and descriptions and, you know, are, is there a trial period? Do you evaluate it? Are there exit options? So there's a lot of detail that's, that goes over in this chapter. Um, 
So things that people can do, you know, assess the status of the career path, help clarify what the farmer is looking for, exploring options, and then supporting both parties. So this would be if if you if you have a mentor coming to you with the explicit goal of finding a successor, it could be a very different process than, you know, again helping people just kind of have a, a sh short term that may turn out into a lifelong mentorship, but if this is the goal, if this is the key thing, it may look very different. And, and thinking about what your role is in facilitating that relationship or helping the mentor figure out what their goals and um, communication is with the trainee throughout that process. And then there's a lot of resources included in this chapter as well that Land for Good has and other land linking programs and succession planning materials and things like that that, that you could draw from. So that was that chapter. And then last but not least, um, chapter six is really where we um, compile all of the resources for mentors. Um, we have case studies throughout the, the toolkit um, and then lots and lots of links. So it is a PDF document so that you can link out to all the many other resources that are organized by both organizations that contributed their resources and the case studies um, that we went through. And, you know, just so that you can be aware of all the other great organizations who already run mentor training programs um, that are available to connect with and, and learn from and that have shared a great wealth of information um, throughout the toolkit and in our online resource library. Um, and then again, the DEI resources are also structured here. Um, by you know, different racial equity and other isms topics so that folks can learn more about that. Um, and then we also categorized it by topic area to make it easy to find. So you know, reading the chapters, it's, it's written to read it, and then there's links throughout. And then at the end in the resource section, we also compiled the resources directly in topic areas. So if you just wanna learn about, you know, I wanna just get right to the heart of communication resources, you can go there or you know, legal resources for ag employment, you can go to that section and just click on all those in one spot. So you don't have to go back and hunt through all the different chapters. And then all of these resources, if they're not linked directly in the toolkit, um, if some of them are not, um, were not publicly accessible on a website, we also link to them in our online resource library. And this is where um, you know, different programs share their kind of backend um, Google Drive folders and, and documents and things that are not something that they're gonna normally post on their website for public consumption. They've shared them with us and we've posted in our online resource library. So, you know, forms and applications and worksheets and, you know, other things that programs use within their actual programs. So again, don't have to create anything from scratch. It's all available online in an easily searchable library. So we hope you take a look at the toolkit, um, make use of it, share it. Um, at the end, there's a, a link to provide feedback on it. Um, we hope that it will be a living document. You know, at some point we'll create version 2.0. So if you're reading through a chapter and you're like, oh, well, you, you missed this one, or this is a great resource that I go to um, in my program, or that I can't believe you overlooked it. We wanna hear about that because we can immediately add it to the online resource library, or we can you know, make a running list of things when we update this toolkit in the future. Um, so just a reminder that our next um, farm mentor training session will be held by the MAFCA um, group up in Maine. And they're going to be scheduling those for Monday afternoons in January, um, probably through early February from four to 6 p.m. each Monday. They'll be free, they'll be online. Hope that you can participate in those. Um, they're already getting a great lineup of speakers um, for each of those sessions to really help their mentors um, build their skills. And then the third one that we'll do as part of this project will be coming up in New York, either late fall, winter next year or early, early winter in 2023 um, at the Glenwood Center in New York. So it's a beautiful spot if you've never been, hopefully that will be in person, hopefully we'll be in a different place in the pandemic <laughs> that we can gather there in a small group and do these in person. So just wanted to open it up and um, encourage folks to ask any questions. I encourage you to join the listserv um, and peruse the online library. If you have a program you wanna have listed, we have our map. Um, we send out our surveys each year about just to collect information about programs. Hope you fill that out and you know, feel free to email me if you have any questions or thoughts or comments or looking for a specific resource, I'm happy to direct anyone to, to those. 
So we have 15 minutes or so. We don't have to take the whole time, but if people have questions or comments or thoughts or other things that you want to dig into, happy to use this time for that. And I'll stop sharing so we can all see each other. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for copying all of those <laughs> resources in the chat as well. I appreciate that. Does anyone have any uh, follow-up questions or thoughts to share? Jennifer, I did have a question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had had any successful stories or models of a farmer or cases where, um, where the program was applied and results were, in your, in your opinion, positive. Um, do you have anything to share? Yeah, um, I would say when we, when we started this project, um, there are really only, I would say, maybe a handful of programs across the country that are really running the kind of programs that we're hoping people, you know, people embrace, I guess, in a way. So, you know, Mafka's had a long running program up in Maine. They were one of our partners um, that I think they've become throughout the, this project much more intentional about their criteria for their mentors um, in the program. And so they ended up putting um, some pretty strict requirements on who mentors could be. So it wasn't just anybody that could sign up. And I think it reduced their mentorship pool by half is what they've said, because once they were like, you know what, we really wanna be serious about folks that are committed to you know, racial equity and justice, or we wanna make sure people are really committed to learning and learning goals, and that we're gonna have these requirements to make, you know, paying fair wages and providing good quality housing, whatever those may be. Some people were on board and some people decided not to continue to be part of that program. Um, the Quivera Coalition, based out of New Mexico, they organize farm and ranch apprenticeships, mostly you know large-scale landscape ranch and livestock operations. They've always um, had a very structured vetting process and are very connected to their host farms and and very networked within that group. And so they have have been on board with this since the very beginning and have expanded their program almost fourfold in the last few years. Um, same thing with Rogue Farm Corps in Oregon. Um, they're another great program that has a lot of really strict, you know, not strict, but like really important criteria that they've always vetted their mentors um, and made sure that they really have um, have the, the, the values that they want to expand through their, um, their programming. So that's another great example. Um, PASA, Sustainable Agriculture, now has developed a registered diversified um, apprenticeship program. So they're also in the process of kind of vetting mentors and um, apprenticeship pairs and things through the system. Dairy grazing apprenticeship has a very structured process and they call their mentors um, master grazers. And so they really got into this, um, this work because of the dairy succession challenge and, and how to you know, transfer dairy businesses to the next generation. And they have um, a really great support structure. They're the, they were one of the first, um, you know, both they're registered in, I think, 13 different states formally with the Department of Labor, and they have the only national, nationally registered um, federal agriculture apprenticeship program. So they're very clear um, that they have, you know, 4,000 hours of paid on the job training with successive, you know, opportunities for increased wage growth among the trainees. They have, you know, 3,000 or whatever, 320 hours of supplemental classroom education partnerships with community colleges or groups like, you know, PASA or others who have supplemental courses and workshops in the states that they operate. So they take their formal registered apprenticeship program very seriously. Um, and then, you know, there are other programs that I think are committed to this that, um, that are kind of getting on board with the need to really focus more mentor training resources so that, um, that these relationships are not just as casual as I think they have been for, <laughs> for decades, but that are really rooted in more formal learning opportunities. So I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but there's a lot of great examples of good organizations that I think take this work seriously that really all contributed to the development of this toolkit and the need for this toolkit because it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of information sharing before or 
there wasn't a lot of organized structure around these programs in the past. So, yeah. That's great, thank great. you. Well, um, if there are there any other comments, questions, thoughts, emotional outbursts? <laughs> Hooray, it's a beautiful day out there, right? <laughs> Great. So I think then with that, I will wrap up with a few of my comments and then we can hang out if we still wanna hang out. Um, so thank you again, Jennifer, for all that great information and insight. We, I want to encourage you all during the in-between sessions between uh, workshops to check out our vendor marketplace and find all the general, generous discount codes and valuable information from our vendors. Um, that link will be in the chat. As well, we have some incredible items that you can bid on in our online auction. So what does they say? Bid early, bid often to get those really cool items. As well, we have, uh, you know, all weekend, we have our upcoming workshops. So you'll want to go to your program book um, and be sure to refresh it if you're leaving it open on your computer because sometimes we will update links. And so you want to have the most up-to-date links and refresh your program book and you'll find that information there. Um, and that's all I have really. So again, thank you very much, Jennifer. And from all of us at NOFA Mass, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Enjoy the day.